Good evening, guys. I hope you are all well. We are into the evening on National Dog Breeder Day. It has been absolutely fantastic. The, the, the social media posts have just been rolling all day. Um, we've seen uh, literally gorgeous stud dogs, lovely, lovely bitches that you guys are breeding from, some cracking litters of puppies. Uh, just the love and the support for ethical breeding has just been absolutely amazing. It's blown me away today. So fantastic for taking part don't stop it doesn't stop till midnight tonight so we're not done yet if you haven't done a post you need to so this evening we are live with caroline taylor who is the the slim um the slim pet vet i have to get that right. a little bit of it the wrong way Do around <laughs> dr caroline the slim yeah, pet dr. Yeah, caroline. Right. we're here with dr caroline and she's coming today to talk to us about um well about a few different subjects she's quite passionate about quite a lot of this of the stuff that we've been talking about this week which is great she is a, a breeder friendly vet guys so um round of applause <laughs> for dr caroline so we want to we want to kind of um well, we want to thank you for being here to start off with thank you for taking your time to come and join us this evening you're really welcome thanks for having me no oh, it's going to be great so we, i think the thing that i want to try to get off with first is that i know i'm very lucky i've got a great vet who is you know very supportive he is happy to talk everything through with me at great length he I think probably understands that I'm coming from a good place with my breeding practices. But I there was an occasion where he was actually on holiday and I knew he was on holiday and I had um, a, a bitch that needed to see the vet and I had to use a, a, a different vet that was close closer to me because David wasn't around. And um, the reception, shall we say, that I got at that vet was quite hostile. It was quite frosty. Um, they, they, they weren't very happy with dealing with me with a pregnant dog. Um, I did explain that, you know, my, my usual vet was on holiday, etc. but they were still quite hostile. And I, I do understand that they see um, a lot of the rescue element of things. And so therefore they don't have a great deal of, of, of experience with breeders they can have a bit of a one-sided picture of what we're all about but it poses a bit of a problem for breeders in that you know we need to be able to to have a good relationship with a vet if we're gonna you know really provide the the fulsome health picture and the health care picture that our our bitches need having that really close working relationship with a vet is super important. So I wanted to talk to you about how, you know, what's your views on that? What's your, what's, what's your take on, on that, really? Well, I think these sorts of relationships um, take time to build. And I think the conditions that we're all in and have been in since, can you believe it's March, nearly two years ago now, oh, when... Still, you know, and it depends what sort of facilities they have, um, but many, many vets, and just like it is at the dentist or the doctor, you can only go in if it's actually absolutely essential that you're there. And so many vets have got quite limited open spaces. The reception areas are often quite small. And so uh, it can be a real worry, can't it, to hand over your dog particularly if they're pregnant or, um, you know, nearing um, uh, whelping, um, not to be able to reassure your dog and, and stay so. with them. Um, you know, just like, you know, I'm sure a lot of your breeders that you um, are here within the group, um, they've they've noticed that the people coming forward to to want a puppy are quite inexperienced mm. um, and they perhaps have done a little bit of research or a lot of research online. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually sensible information that they're getting, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, there can be a real different, you know, and they maybe think, OK, they've researched uh, often what people do is buy the sort of dog they that for the lifestyle they want rather than the lifestyle, the lifestyle they that they actually have. Very so fun. they want a dog. OK, oh, I want husky because I want to be able to go running in the forest and, you know, doing this and all. And, and actually they live, you know, 
um, in a three bed flat or something with, yeah. you know, two flights of stairs to go up and, you know, the exercise that those dogs then or dog will have is running up, you know, three or four flights of stairs, which obviously, as we know, is not ideal, particularly with, you know, larger, larger breed dogs. So, um, I think we, we've also seen new breeders coming on board and um, we'll talk about this a lot later as well. But, you know, it might be that they're not necessarily aware of the breed tests that can be done. And I'm not just talking about DNA tests and things like that. Um, and it might be that they're, they're, they might be new to breeding, but they haven't necessarily thought, well, I'm having they haven't selected their dog necessarily for breeding. They've, okay. they've got a dog that they really, you know, is a great family pet, but they haven't necessarily thought, well, you know, oh, well, it did have a hernia when it was little, but that's not going to matter. And all these little things like this, that actually, you know, if you've got three dogs, one of which has a hernia and two don't, then choose one of the other ones, you know, or or ideally, you know, it, just those little things, um, but not just like simple things like that, things like heritable conditions that we know are heritable, but we don't, there's obviously so many genes, allergy, you know, uh, temperament, obviously, confirmation, you know, just a, a, a few a few things there, really. Um, so, so what you're saying is, is that you, you're seeing an influx of breeders who haven't necessarily done their homework not necessarily the breeders but the owners and it's really I feel privileged if the if the new because we often see you know the new puppies coming through oh and I feel very privileged if that pup uh, that new puppy owner has actually seen the um the bitch not necessarily the stud dog uh maybe pictures but it's still, you know, very much that you would think that is a basic, you know, you want to see how the conditions and how it's been bred. But even that isn't isn't being done. So, you know, I think what is hard is that vets at the moment are under huge amounts of time pressure, as well as these very difficult situation that they're in. And that time that it takes to build those relationships in terms of what an, a breeder needs is, is in really important, um, but it's not urgent unless, you know, it's a C-section or, or, or something like that. So I think even though, you know, we it, the, the vets are still sort of trying to provide all this service across the board, obviously the urgent things and um, the more emergency situations tend to take priority. And so those, those relationships that are so important to build are sort of, you know, it might take many weeks to get that urgent visit Absolutely. and then that, that, that visit booked in for, to check your, your bitch over before breeding, say. And then by then, or maybe she came into season early and then you you didn't quite. But all those things where you think, well, actually, when when is the best timing to do a vaccination for Parvo before pregnancy? You know what? You know, do we do it three months? Do we do it six months? What what is the best timing of that? Because obviously we can't do it when they're already pregnant. Um, and and to get advice on that, those sorts of things, you know, um, I do want to reassure you, though, that, you know, you if you are having to let your animal go, um, we, we found that actually in practice when and I know it's really hard as a sort of professional breeder that you're really used to handling animals. And it's not that you're not capable. But if you actually think from the veterinary practice perspective, most clients of the dogs do not have do not know how to hold a puppy or a dog for a subcutaneous injection or to examine its ears mm. or to, you know, collect a blood sample. So actually to have trained personnel, so a trained veterinary nurse um, within the practice who knows what to do, actually a lot of the vet practices have found that it's more efficient and less stressful for the animals yeah. rather than, oh, well, well, we'll see if the owner can hold oh, well, no, actually, they can't. And now the dog's a bit agitated. So we'll get someone in to, you know, wrap them in a towel or whatever, you know, whatever form of gentle restraint that that will happen. And actually, if you just had, we, we've discovered that actually, if you just go in with that professional 
um, handling from the word go, actually everything is smoother and, and it, more efficient. And obviously at the moment, we're, most vets are maximising efficiency yeah, because yeah, they're under yeah. such, absolutely, such time absolutely, pressure. Absolutely. So, you know, and, and actually remember that the restrictions that are in place that are stopping, you know, you going into the vets or, or, or spending that time um, is not because the veterinary team necessarily want that. It's because of, you know, I... I have been working for a very small practice and they actually had to close their doors for a week because, you know, one staff member had COVID yeah, yeah, and then yeah. all the other practice members were contacts. And yeah. so suddenly there was not the, yeah, and that's obviously yeah. the last thing that even though, you know, it's, you know, most people are vaccinated and things against on from the COVID side now, um, it still it has it that. Stop you, but it still doesn't stop you from getting it. I had COVID no, it doesn't stop you from getting it, and it I'm, has that impact down. on businesses. Yeah. So they want to still be able to provide that service. So okay. you know, it's it's often you know, it's it's small teams can be you know more exposed. To more that exposed. Than but than take take the COVID situation out of it. So you know, let's say we accept and we understand as breeders that we're going to take our dogs to the vet and they're going to be taken into the surgery and all of that. Because just because we're breeders, we shouldn't be treated any differently. We don't want no. to be treated any differently to any yeah. other dog owner. Absolutely. Okay? But I'm talking about like the relationship with them. So being able to speak openly about your breeding plans and having advice given that's in a non-judgmental capacity because before we moved to where we moved to and before I found the vet that I currently work with, it was very difficult as somebody who wanted to breed to get advice from the vets and get advice from the veterinary nurses because there was this, this is not, this is long before COVID, forget COVID, yeah. take COVID out of it. Absolutely. It was, it was, no, it was yeah. really difficult to get advice because there was this judgment around, you know, well, why are you breeding? straight away why, why do you think yeah. you're good enough to breed what do you yeah. felt like you were justifying what you were well hang on a minute I haven't actually decided to breed I'm trying to ask some questions here yeah and if you use the I, I want to breed word you're like ah, you know it's it's really interesting because I actually took like you said you wanted a sort of an opinion from a vet's perspective and I actually thought okay let's just turn it on the head from a breeder's perspective you know what you you know that you need to be worming your puppies you know at, at this intervals after they've been born you've done the microchip at home because that's much less stressful and you've had a proper training in that and you can do you don't have to do all of them at once in a strange environment all of that you can do you know when each individual puppy is ready and it's calm and all of that you know you it may only be that you'll see your vet once because you'll they'll have a primary course of vaccination and then the second jab, the second injection will be done at the new practice because yeah. at the new owners. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it's, it's from, but then if you look from a vet's perspective, it's like, oh, well, they're not getting the microchip done here, but that's probably best for the puppy. Oh, oh they're only paying for one vaccination. And it, it's suddenly you feel, like, oh, well, they don't eat, you know, it's hard. We're, you know, we're not even seeing the bitch sometimes because we'll just see the puppies. We don't check the okay. bitch over at all. Okay. If it's been a normal, this is this is just the normal yeah. situation. Absolutely. 100%. The bitch is fine. You don't need to take her in because she's yeah. fine. Yeah. But from the vet's perspective, it's suddenly like, oh, we've just got these puppies. We don't even know who, you know, who, who they're they from, are, where they come from, who they're coming from, you know. Um, so there's then, and also with the timing and things like that, there's very little then opportunity for that discussion of oh when are you going to have your next litter or are you going to have a litter or are you thinking of maybe breeding one of these puppies in you know and 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 carrying on the line that way um so basically equally, it, it, so basically to, to kind of improve that if 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 a breeder were to perhaps in the first instance approach the vet and say hey i know we can't come in at the moment but, you know, I'm thinking about breeding from my bitch. She is a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Uh, you know, what is your advice for me? I'm just, you know, you're the professional. How are we going to go about doing this? I want your support around this, you know. Absolutely. And and I'll, I'll put this here just because, you know, I think this is like that little bit of tension as well, because maybe the new puppies 
um, coming in. But there is always that fear from a vet's point of view that, you know, that there's these breeders are just out to make a quick buck and they're not yep. in the interested in the long term interests of the bitches and, you know, um, rather than, you know, that opportunity to create high standards and maintain happy, healthy dogs, family dogs, that that's what obviously your aim is. Um, So I think it's really important to have this conversation really early on, um, way before you take the bitch to stud and actually say, okay, are you going to do progesterone testing or or are you going to do cytology or discuss the different options available? Do you want, you know, the vet to be able to do that? Be willing to pay for that that little bit of advice you know it's not unfortunately I I would think you know ideally you'd think oh I just want to have a really long chat with the vet on the phone maybe you know that is more appropriate to you it for you if you prefer to to pay for a a telephone consultation for 15-20 minutes say that you know, because it's more about the discussion rather than and and actually, you know, maybe, you know, often it's the receptionists that are a little bit of the gatekeepers. So it's getting through <laughs> those as well and, and everyone's expectations. Um, but that's a but, lovely way to pave the pave the path forward. So the vet exactly you if need, you know if for you see somebody uh, who is considering it, all of their options. You know, yeah. if you're going to ring the vet and talk to them about the options regarding the canine herpes virus vaccine, for example. Exactly. You know, taking exactly that, what tests you should do. Come, you know, this so, will go on to how many tests there are. There's so many hundreds of oh. tests that you could do, and Me. but your veterinary surgeon is the one who will be abreast of all of the different options or at least if you you know not necessarily spring it on them you know when you have a litter of puppies but you know arrange another time to have this discussion so that your vet can do the research for your particular breed and you know it may be that there'll be two or three breeds that they have to research because of obviously the trend of you know cavapoos or yeah, or different yeah, yeah, breeds yeah, coming together yeah, yeah. um I and they can help really you decide to, which is is which the is best the way forward I think half for now and maybe you won't do absolutely everything to begin with yeah. but you'll do this first then you know you'll, you'll produce a litter and yeah. then the next stage you will go well which you know we'll we'll see you know before you decide which puppy you want to keep say for breeding maybe at that point get you know have a look and see what the vet thinks about that and include them in those conversations and those decisions um and then if it comes to you know oh this you know three or four weeks down the line or this puppy's not doing so well they'll be there to jump on it and and actually you know obviously you know when it's a sick puppy you know everyone's all action stations but you don't want that to be the first Port of call. Port if of the call. vet's already invested in what you're doing, is aware exactly. of what you're doing. Phone exactly. Up, and it's Rebecca a long term relationship. You know, the, Rebecca Walters is on the phone. She's tell, she's ringing to say that her bitch is, as the, the temperature's dropped, and it's likely that labor's going to start within the next 24 hours just to let yeah. you know. Yeah, right? absolutely. All absolutely. of these conversations. And mm. I mean, I, I think it is difficult now, isn't it? Because so many vets will not be 24 mm. 7 because yeah. they'll have the out of hours. But if that's the case, ring you know ring the emergency vets ring the emergency line to find out okay who is going to be the vet who will be on call that night if it is tonight you know at seven eight o'clock when when the phones go through it's it it's i can't think of a practice that charges you for ringing and and actually then your minds if you know right. you know much better that they're aware of it oh we might have this but we might not but we'll we'll see yeah and then That's it's not better. a shock. It's not a shock when when you phone. You know, I always give my vet the courtesy. He he's an independent um, practitioner and he runs his own his own surgery, and so he's managing his own staff. So if I know that I've got something that he's going to go or he's likely to whelp over a weekend, for example, I'll ring him and I'll say to him, David, this bitch is going to go over the weekend, and you know, just I'm just giving you the heads up. You know, it, it might be a maiden bitch, never had puppies before, therefore the stakes are higher that you're going to have to go in and see your vet. You know, or if she's an experienced bitch that's had pups before, and I'm not so, you know, on tenterhooks about it, I'll tell him that. 
you know and that's the time you know that you can find out the prices and okay if it if they're closed or if something you're going somewhere else then you know it might vary because you know at least you have a plan though then but you have a plan for example he was closed and he was like becky we've got no out of hours this weekend you'll need to go to you know brownlow and Ellsmith. i know what my i know exactly and how far it is and 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 the distance that you've got to go exactly the the other thing that occurred to me that that i was speaking to somebody else about a couple of days ago is actually that they use a vet that is is really not very experienced at dealing with with pregnant dogs um and they they actually didn't have oxytocin in stock now, some of you who are watching this might not know what oxytocin is, but it's an injection that's given to um, to help the bitch produce a stronger contraction um, if she's struggling to give birth um, and she's feeling, you know, she's getting weaker and she's the contractions are not strong enough. The vet will give oxytocin to promote um, and stimulate some contractions. And that's all usually the first thing that happens when you get to the vet and you've got a puppy that's stuck or the, or the labor's not progressing as it should, normally the first thing that they do, they might scan the bitch, they might give the bitch an internal examination and then they would give an oxytocin injection to stimulate the contractions and see if they can have a puppy naturally born. But of course, if they don't have oxytocin because they didn't know that there was potentially a pregnant bitch coming in and they didn't have the opportunity to order it in, then the only option at that point is a C-section you're forcing their hand. So if you don't give them the heads up, and I know that, you know, there'll be a lot of people going, what do you yeah, mean? Yeah, I mean, medical, happens, guys, <laughs> you know? medical supplies yeah. are very difficult at the moment, you know, because, you know, things that you think, oh, why can't I book my cat in for a vaccination or my dog in for a vaccination? <laughs> supplies are severely limited at the moment. We're, you know, across... The UK vets are prioritising kittens and puppies um, and having to compromise on um, booster injections um, in terms of tithing just to try and keep enough um, uh, for, for, but, you know, that's just one issue. It, unfortunately, there are issues with supplies of other medications, herpes vaccination you mentioned, uh, we yeah. normally order in, especially for each. Um, it doesn't come in large um uh, doses you have to order each individual um vial it's not necessary i wouldn't say every um pitch that i see will have a herpes virus vaccination and it's not completely um curative if if you mm-hmm. you but it, it does prevent the puppies from getting the disease when they're in utero but unfortunately if the bitch has had herpes virus she can still pass it on even if she's had the vaccination um during birth and through the milk as well and that's why hopefully the vaccination will help prevent um the puppies will have the immunity until while they're you know very little because that will be transferred while they are in utero and then their own immunity will will pick up by sort of three or four weeks to to protect them um but you can still but you know that's the best we've got because herpes virus is it, it like in us it's ubiquitous you know it's very difficult to eliminate it yeah Absolutely. So they're just a few examples of why it's really important to have this open communication um, with the vet, because if you don't, you're kind of walking into helping with your hands down by your sides. You know, your vet is actually your right hand man. You know, don't don't limit yourself and limit your options for your bitch by thinking I'm not going to call the vet or I don't want to spend the money or, you know, or, you know, I don't need the vet on her. You are all at some point, if you choose to breed dogs at some point, doesn't matter how good you are, how many. Books yeah. You've read, and I, and that, I think I'll, I'll also mention, you know, you know, these days there are so many vets out there that you will find someone who, you know, there's no point if you feed raw and you go to a vet who completely disagrees with that, that's going to be a bit of a clash, you yeah, know, find a different vet. so find, find a different vet. There's, you know, there's holistic vets there. There's vets who will do complementary medicine as part of their um, uh, rehab and all of that. Um, I don't know about the use of acupuncture in pain in terms of um, uh, bitches in labour, but, you know, there are, you know, there are so that, that if you if you look for what 
different people um, and, and different vets and, and the communities are offering, mm-hmm. you will find that, that there will be someone within your local area, I would hope, um, that, that would, would be a good fit. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the the long and the short of it is, is if you if you what you're choosing to do with your dog is a specialist thing. When you decide to breed from your dog, you're not you know, you're not taking your dog to an obedience class. You're not, you know, taking it for a walk around the park. You're choosing to to reproduce from that dog. And so therefore you are bringing in a whole world of, you know, biology and, you know, for which you're not trained. And so therefore the vet is just like, you know, I have to give it water, I have to give it food and I have to have a vet. (laughs) Kind of like, you know, they're just, it runs in line for me. So if that means you, as Caroline says, need to, um, you know, formulate a relationship with a vet that maybe is a bit further away from where you live. um, And that, that means that, you know, at the point of whelp, you might not actually get to see that particular vet if you know, you needed to see somebody more cl- closer to where you lived. But for your ongoing advice and for, for your planning and for all of the other, if, if there's somebody that you find that and they're that little bit further away, do the drive because the peace of mind you get from being able to pick up the phone and speak to somebody. Um, and I've actually got a question on the screen here saying, <coughs> is, is the phone call thing actually a thing at the moment? Because, you know, our vet's too busy to be, um making phone calls and I, I think um I think they could fit it in as an ordinary consultation but instead of it being in person it would be over the telephone for Absolutely. advice a paid yeah. advice call yeah I mean it's uh, there's still quite a mixed opinion on telemedicine uh, you know whether that's over a text or on the phone yeah um uh, in the UK because so many conditions um Re- rely on you know even skin disease Eyes you can on. send a picture yeah. but you need to see it you need yeah. to examine yeah. it you need to make sure that there isn't anything else going on and yes i completely agree that to expect a vet at the end of a really busy day long consulting session to give you a call for free to have a chat for no, 20 minutes you know is is but you know actually if you prefer you know okay they will want to see your obviously your animals if they're prescribing something um and and have them on the system but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have that discussion at that time you know it might actually be easier to have that telephone conversation yeah most most vets will still offer that you know we're still doing a lot of triage for you know say um with sending in photographs or something like that and having a conversation and and doing that and and saving those consultation t- slots for those that really need it just because there isn't enough time in the day enough often time. Time. um but, but you, you know, know and guidance, having the guidance stuff around health testing and yeah you know, that doesn't need to be done in person if no it doesn't a plan if you want to create yeah. a pregnancy plan with your vet that doesn't need to happen you know in person that can happen over yeah. the phone that can happen it by can. email you know that can yeah. happen over a period of time yeah and that helps to build that relationship, you know, that helps to, 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 to pave the way for when you are in a panic, you've got a puppy that's stuck, she's a maiden bitch, you're a novice breeder, it's two o'clock in the morning, you've been awake for three days because the dog has been going into labour for three days and you're completely on, you know, for want of a better word, exhausted and can't think straight. You mm. don't want somebody at the other end of the phone not really clued up about who you are and what dog you've got mm. and that she's mm. even pregnant and that they were even going to be expecting to be dealing with a with a pregnant bitch at this mm. point. Give them the heads up and mm. then it makes the path a lot smoother, um, a lot smoother for everybody. So uh, around, you know, from a vet's perspective, if you had to give breeders a piece of advice in the years that you've been practicing, if you, if there was, you know, a little nugget that you could, you could go, do you know what? I wish breeders would do X, Y, Z. You're going to hate this question. Sorry about that. Um, well, think, you know, for one thing, I'm like, oh, advice. this There's one like thing. Billion. <laughs> but, you know. I mean, I, I would say that the one thing is, is to, Try and take sort of, you know, emotion in terms of picking your breeding stock out of it 
and actually look at the dog in front of you. Uh, because if this is going to be, you know, the start of, you know, the 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 following, you know, it's not just this year. You know, it's what you're building up for years to come. And so, you know, it may be that they have the most wonderful confirmation and, and breed characteristics, but perhaps the temperament isn't quite right. And it's you've got to decide that compromise between the sire and the dam and how that goes together. But, you know, you want to... I guess it's between those four things, isn't it? Of uh, confirmation, temperament, genetic diversity. So making sure there is you, 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 you're opening up that um, genetic diversity as much as possible. And then there's all these sorts of tools, aren't there? Like inbreeding coefficient and, um, you know, all of these different things. Actually, part of the reason, I don't know if there are any uh, Stabyhoon owners here, but the Stabyhoon breed is one actually originating from, it's a dog I have, it's about three or 400 in the UK, originally came from, Holland, but they actually do DNA swab testing on every single dog within the group and not just outbreed from in terms of the what the family tree looks like, but actually at that DNA level Definitely. and actually see how to, to outcross things as much as possible because it is a small and, and those the sort of things now that we have, the dog genome, those sorts of things that are completely um possible so how do you choose you know my next sort of chat is how do you choose you know the the best breeding pair that you can and I think this is where you know the health tests come in and it may not be that you will do every single test from the word go but these are the sorts of things that even you know the general practitioner vet you know, that is going to be the one that is going to be the closest to you in the event of emergency these vets will be able to make sure number one okay is your dog fit and healthy and able is it ready is it free of you know a skin disease uh you know reduced chance of other heritable conditions um you know basic things like are the vaccinations up to date what do we want to vaccinate every year or are we going to do it three years or if you're going to be breeding most core vaccines distemper hepatitis parvo will last for three years but you wouldn't necessarily want to breed right, from a bitch yeah. that hadn't had a vaccine for two right, and a half years right, right. because of the much higher incidence of parvo. And obviously your local vet will know these variations. You know, how likely is it that your dog might have lungworm, which can be a really, really serious problem. But um, and, and um, it can be quite mild symptoms, just a little mild cough. Um, but you can't necessarily treat your dog in pregnancy. So how are you going to prevent and reduce the risks of and different areas of the country have different um, likelihood of getting these different diseases? Unfortunately, there are some diseases that um, have been imported recently, uh, like blood disorders and things like that from parasites. So, we, you know, your vet will be know what the local situation is and can advise is probably one of the best people to advise on on sort of future health testing. So even as a basic health test, you know, your your vet is more than qualified to be able to do that for you, you know. In terms of, you know, even if at the beginning you're not necessarily going to be elbow scoring and hip scoring, um, but but as a basic, every single animal before they're bred, before every single, you know, mating, I would say should have a, a, at least a basic check. Well, I go I go one step further than that. I take the party line before you breed your dog you do every possible genetic test. It is not ethical to breed from a dog that is not health tested. Um, if we are choosing to create life, you guys know my mantra on this. If we're choosing to create life, we create the best we can we can create. And, 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 and second best is not good enough. You know, it's just not good enough to not go through. The information is there um, and, and we should all be testing 
We it can go done. directly. Yeah. Animal yeah. animal DNA diagnostics, animal genetics, animal health trust, unfortunately, doesn't exist anymore. Lubocklin Labs, Pet Genetics Lab, Pinmore Animal yeah. Laboratory Services will all provide these screening DNA testing. And they take two minutes to do. Yeah. And if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, they can be done with, with um, the swabs inside the swab in the mouth. Really, yeah. really, really easy to do. Um, and I, I've actually got a, a video tutorial. If anybody's not sure on how to do it, I've got a video tutorial that I can send over. I can post it in the group of, of me um, health testing or me pretending. Sometimes like a mini testing. little toothbrush, isn't it? Yeah, so it yeah. it sort of gets and the some cells. Some of them are from... not even like a toothbrush. Some of them no, are from, just a from swab. Clean. They, they're just like um, just like an earbud. And you yeah. just inside the thing, let yeah. it dry and send it off. It's really, really straightforward. You know, honestly, you would have to be really dense to not be able to do it. So I'm sure everybody here is going to going to going to manage. And yes, some of the health testing is a little bit more invasive. You know, the hip and elbow scoring, some of the eye tests are not you know, great. They're always, I don't like, I'm not, I've got a thing about eyes. I'm not great with people shoving stuff in my eyes. And I always feel sorry for my dogs. But, you know, I have seen um dogs you know who have uh, who have gone blind and it isn't nice and I have seen dogs young dogs with with hip and elbow problems and that also isn't nice and I would never want to be somebody who had knowingly bred a litter of puppies when there is a test that can be done and saying my dog looks all right it's never thrown a lame step it all seems fine to me age two that's not that doesn't cut it you need x-rays you need to be able to see yeah. and you need professionals to be able to read those x-rays and tell you what your dog's hip scores are these systems have been devised to protect the future health of the dogs that we love and the, of the dogs that we're going to spend our lives with and it's really important that we maintain those systems absolutely maintain There's those standards. absolutely brilliant summaries so all these schemes in the uk are run by the british veterinary association and um they are they then use specialist vets to whether it's examine the eyes or the x-rays that are taken at the standard vet um so we've got four different schemes We've got the hereditary eye disease scheme, which has been one of the longest running schemes. These are for all sorts of sometimes congenital neonatal eye problems that are present at birth. Others that if you um, have got bitches and studs, they can be examined at any age. An annual inspection or is, is advised because some of them are hereditary, but they don't occur when they're young. Yeah, so yeah. if you've got a stud dog or a, a bitch who is older, three, four, five, te, um, eight, maybe, even then it would be best to get them examined regularly. Um, common breeds that are affected, Border Collie, Cocker Spaniel, Springer Spaniel, French Bulldog, Golden Retriever. So that's in terms of hereditary scheme. And there's a really good summary in terms of what they look for, what they're examining, where they're taking place, who does it. So all different vets, uh, specialist vets around the country will do this for you. Um, then the next sort of major scheme is the elbow and the hip score scheme. So it has to be done when your dog is over one year of age. And usually it's only done once in the animal's life. And after it can be done under sedation, but usually general anaesthetic. So, you know, you need to ask your local vet and obviously say it's not just that you're x-raying the hips and seeing what they think. It, it needs to be sent to the BVA, um, which now I think this, they've gone back to a turnaround of about a week or two. Um, yeah, you know, there was very, a big delay quick. for a while. Very, very, um, very fast. Very, yeah. very fast. Yeah. And I think submission is something like seventy pounds, mm -hmm. and obviously, then you've got the costs of the X-rays mm -hmm. and the. And the they will, despite contrary belief, they will score crossbreeds. Okay, I know that they can't put them in, on any kind of register, but the BVA will score crossbreeds. Oh yeah, any yeah, dog. So don't this need is... to worry. This is not just for purebred dogs. These no, schemes, absolutely not. These schemes Golden Doodle, Vishla, Labradoodle. You know, absolutely. They do they, they keep a record of all the dogs that are tested. And even you know for the mixed breeds, they will keep a register of the breed average. 
okay, it, it, you know, the, the mixed breed Labradoodle, is that now a breed? I guess, you know, we're sort of getting you know, there now, aren't we, really? Yeah, we are there. Um, yeah. And okay, the, app, the, the advice is from the BVA, you should only breed from dogs that are below the breed average, which yeah. I think used to be about 12 and a half for Labradors, and I think it's now gone down to mm. about nine. Mm -hmm. um but really we should be breeding ideally from dogs with zero hip scores mm -hmm. you know the lowest possible the lowest possible the lowest the, possible. The, you know and, and the same for it's slightly different with elbows they sort of get a naught one two and three zero, you want zero, zero, though. El but elbows. you want zero zero you yeah want zero, and zero on elbows. It, it's you know the difficulty is you know, those extra costs that have gone into doing that, you know, educating the potential purchasers that that is important. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously, you know, something that both of the vets, the BVA, you know, and, and you know, responsible breeders need to be doing mm -hmm. because it's otherwise, you know, why? Oh, why should I why should I get that done? because I'm not going to be breeding my dogs. So why do I, because it's so important for the health and welfare of, you know, dogs going forward. Going forward. To, and and most people now, time, most people now, yeah. one of the standard questions you get asked when you're, um, you know, when you're selling a litter of puppies is, are the parents health tested? You know, and, and, you know, you don't want to be standing there saying no, no. because the, why, why are they not health tested? Because you didn't want to spend the money. That's the only answer because there's no other answer other than you did. You decided that it wasn't important enough. Mm. The long term health of those mm. dogs was not important enough to spend the money. That's the only mm. reason for not health testing. Mm. There's no other excuse, um, and it's not it's not a good enough one. I'm afraid. No. You know no. the bottom line, and I know that sounds harsh, but you know you can't you can't you can't be a little bit of a dog breeder. You can't, you know, just going to, you know, just going to, just going to breed one litter so we don't need to bother health testing. Well, that bitch might have 10 puppies. That's 10 dogs you're responsible for, mm. you know, and, and that's a massive responsibility by anybody's mm. standards. So mm. it's got to be done properly from the very beginning. It's a huge responsibility and, it, you know, not one that should be, should be taken mm. lightly, especially not from a health perspective especially absolutely so we've got the hereditary eye disease we've got elbow scoring we've got hip scoring finally it would be the um cavalier king charles scheme although it's not just exclusive to cavaliers any breed that is and it's not for well there is a tentative breeding scheme for heart disease because obviously cavaliers can get heart disease really commonly but that's not at the stage where it's um required on the on the case required or no. it's 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 Advised, very much yeah. so watch this space but there is um this is where you get tested uh, that your dog would get tested for chiari malformation and syringomelia which are diseases that affect uh that it's, it's sort of this uh, fly catching or ear scratching disease but it can be and it's because of the shape of the skulls and where the spinal cord is affected around the neck um, and um, submission is around 100 pounds but what needs to happen is an MRI so the cost of this procedure is much much higher, much higher than standard yeah. x-rays okay. but it's such a horrendous disease um, that really, you know, it should be given massive priority because it's, um, you know, it can get worse as they get older. It's not always apparent when they're a year, uh, when they're born, um, but it can normally around sort of one to two, the steins begin. And sometimes it's so severe that they need to be put to sleep, at, you know, at sort of three, four five years old so it can it can be a really really severe disease so if there's something you can do that you can prevent that happening and it's not just for cavaliers boston terriers uh chihuahuas Havanese, maltese papillons pomeranians staffies staffordshire bull terriers can be affected with this um yorkshire terriers as well um so it's open to all dogs and crosses um so you know, it's 
it is far more expensive than having the other yeah. things done. But, you know, I would say, you know, it's still a drop in the ocean compared to the cost that this disease can cause or and that emotional burden oh, and it can can, yeah. can yeah. cause on people if, yeah. if 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 it can be prevented absolutely one of the things that i wanted to say on on these particular so um, most of you guys know that i've got a german wire haired pointer called sally um who is currently in the utility room on her bed eating a something that used to belong to a cow um hizzle Normally she would be running up and down the stairs, you see, if I leave her out. So she's no, you didn't hear that. <laughs> I said the P word. Um, but she's not fat. She's okay. She's thin actually. So she's <laughs> um, so and they are really high so, calorie treats. They are really high calories, but they are also very good at keeping a 15-month-old point of quiet while I'm working. So she's <laughs> she's in the utility room enjoying that. But my point is, I am a dog breeder, okay, and I have a dog who I adore. She is, you know, working, doing scent work. She's, you know, representing the breed at Discover Dogs. She's a super cool German wire head pointer, right? And she meets breed standards in terms of, you know, her size and shape. Confirmation is fantastic. Temperamentally, she's ace. Very trainable dog. And if you go onto the Kennel Club website and have a look at what the breed um, test requirements are, it is... Um, from Willebrand's disease and that's it okay that's that's mm. the only thing that's actually required of the breed okay mm. but if you speak to the breed club they actually want hips elbows and heart scan okay so my advice on that would be we all go we've got health testing let's look at what the kennel club say but actually the kennel club have on their website what has been a big enough problem within the breed that they deem it necessary to have, you know, specific tests. However, the breed clubs will be hearing, you know, on the jungle drums long before the kennel club actually make it a thing, that there are other issues that are potentially forming within the breed. And more specifically within breed lines, they will have more information localized to the actual pedigree of your dog. So I, for example, rang um, the health secretary of the German Wirehead Pointer Club, had a lovely conversation with her on the phone. She was really, really keen to give me all of the information about the about the wire hairs and about, you know, what they need, what I should be looking for. And there is actually a whole host of testing that I'll be doing on Sally, you know, that, that if I'd have just looked at the Kennel Club website, I wouldn't have known anything about the other testing that that I needed to do and and that was only triggered I only rang her in the first instance because I'd seen on the German Wirehead Pointer Facebook group a couple of young dogs had passed away very suddenly from a heart condition mm. but literally they'd, the owners had woken up in the morning and these dogs had, had passed away in the night heartbreaking 15 months old and 13 months old and mm. I, I started to panic I was like oh my god she's that age, I'm going to wake up in the morning and she's going to be dead. So probably because my husband will have killed her. No, I'm only joking. Um, and, 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 you know, so I started to, started to Google it and started to have a look at what I could find, went to the Kennel Club website, didn't get the information that I needed. So I went to the health secretary of, of the club. So guys, look at that as an option as well. You know, get in contact with your breed clubs and speak to the people who are on the ground because they'll probably be lobbying the, the 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 kennel club to get more breed tests recognized by the kennel mm. club that, that's how mm. it works yeah that's how the system yeah. works so mm. you know that's a it's a good way of, of finding out the the whole the whole picture for your particular breed absolutely absolutely um, Right. So yeah, that would be my what about... was that one thing I don't know one no, thing pick the best things. possible the best possible dogs that you can to absolutely. breed from now, I know that um, dogs and their weight is, uh, is a really important thing to you. Obviously, you are the slim, the slim pet vet, so kind of the clues in the name. Um, and let, let's talk about how we can keep our, our bitches um, in, in peak condition nutritionally through their pregnancy um, and possibly a little bit around the weaning time because yeah. I see lots of questions in the group about, um two, two things that I, I, I hear um she's had the puppies and she looks like a hat rack she's gone really skinny 
and it doesn't really matter what I feed her, she's not gaining any weight. How do I deal with that? That's the, one of the first things that we, we have. And then the, the other one is around um, we are we're weaning the puppies. She wants to eat the puppy food, but we're weaning the puppies now. And this is a very, very tricky time. How do we control how much milk she's making, that the puppies are getting enough milk? They're also having some hard feed. You know, mm. we don't want her to get mastitis, but we don't want her to be hungry. Mm. And, uh, you know, all of those questions that come around mm. around that kind of subject. So what, what advice have you got to give us on that front, Caroline? Well, um, yes, yeah, so obviously weight is really important. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit towards the end about, you know, why I chose what, what th- this area, because, you know, so many dogs that I see, you know, have essentially a preventable condition, you know, being overweight and they're so much more prone to lots of diseases you know um obviously arthritis but diabetes heart disease anyway i'll I'll talk about that um in a little bit of time but i've got different stages that i thought let's just talk about the nutrition that a a bitch needs at different stages and break it down because it starts way before you know the lactation oh they're really they, they, they can't whatever i feed them they're really really skinny um because that that is absolutely true it almost you know if you're thinking um i I found this amazing chart which showed the um what a bitch needed as you're going through you know two weeks four weeks eight weeks and it's absolutely astronomical and almost impossible for a dog a bitch to be able to eat enough calories to be able to provide what the puppies need at that sort of, you know, just before weaning stage three, four, five weeks. But if we look at that pre-mating time, um, now pre-mating, it's a really important time because we don't want the bitch necessarily to be overweight because that's not going to necessarily help her during the pregnancy and during you know lactation ha- carrying lots of extra we want to ensure that she's getting a high quality adult maintenance food um, and maintain her around about four or five uh, body condition score um, you can use an all stages diet but remember all stages diets really means puppy food so it might be that in that pre-mating time all stages might actually still be a bit too rich at that time um and this is where it's really important to know what your bitch weighs now what body condition score they are because this is what we can use to then compare at the end of her pregnancy she should be around 25 percent heavier than that because that won't just be puppies, but it will be all the fluid and, and all of that as well. So in early pregnancy, her nutritional needs don't really change very much. She doesn't really need much extra. It's often, you know, a bit like us, you think, oh, we'll, we'll feed her up now. She need, needs a bit more. But she did actually very similar to this pre-pregnancy state. Um sometimes they can have a little bit of a reduction in appetite then. Mm-hmm. And then maybe, you know, I don't know if you've noticed that in, in, in bit, your dogs. They might tend to find a bit of morning sickness around day 30, yeah. 35. Yeah. Off, it, it, if they're going to, it tends to be around then and just go off their food. Or just yeah. don't, they, haven't got a they might have appetite. change in their exercise needs or, you know, that they don't want to do quite as much. Um, so I think early pregnancy is a really useful time to think about what they're going to need later and actually think about that. OK, we well, even though they don't need as much, they need about the same, they don't really need puppy food. Actually, it's probably quite a good time to sort of change them onto that because they don't need to eat as much of it. It's higher calorie density. It's also going to be higher in the EPA, DHA. These are the only the threes that are really important when puppies are developing all the neurological development of the brain um, and, and all of that. Um, and it also helps in the ossification as well. Obviously, we know that process goes on way into you know puppyhood. Um, but if you're feeding a puppy diet, you don't need to supplement your bitch either with anything. It was going to provide everything you need to. And I would argue, OK, supplements are, are, have their place. But actually, if it's within the food, you know, the EHA, it's going to be absorbed that much better. 
um, than if it's given. So, do you advise to move? Because this is this is a quite a common question to to change your bitch onto puppy food. Do you I, advise? I, that absolutely, you do that? absolutely. Um, but in in that sort of yeah late gestational milk. Uh, producing lactation. phase lactation okay, right. phase absolutely so not, that not is going to be the best yes prior because it's usually easier because of these different changes that they need during late gestation it may be you don't want to be changing it then that's the thing is yeah. that the best time yeah. to change the diet this is where you may they may have they might not to want to eat as much at a one time they might start grazing because All they just days. get full yeah. Um, then they're obviously all their mammary development is going on as well. Um, you can get significant amount of fluid build up. So, you know, maybe adding in a little bit of wet food instead of just providing dry food because of the moisture level. It'll be, it'll be um, so although obviously wet food is going to be a lot more water within it. So maybe they, they'll get full quicker. And obviously not get as much a nutrition, you know, and I, I guess that goes the same for raw food as well. They've got to take in a lot more bulk. So actually dry food, even though, you know, it, it's much more calorie dense for what for what they um, uh, will eat. There is an increase in this time, in this last few weeks of pregnancy now um, in their protein, they need extra energy and they need those extra micronutrients as well. So that's why puppy food, I would say, is appropriate at that time. Okay, okay. Not so much in the early pregnancy, but definitely in that last three, three to okay, four Okay, so, so you're going to say you're going to scan your bitch somewhere between 28 and 35 days. Yeah. And after you've scanned, you know, you're then going to consider moving over onto a puppy food. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, a lot of vets will say, you know, you can palpate a bitch, can't you? Even a sort of 20 day 26. Yeah, yeah. So but usually a scan won't be till post 30 days just because you're never quite sure of the ovulation date unless you've been really careful with the, the, the testing. Yeah, I'm most, sure most people on here will be. Bang on yeah, the they, they know they know to, to the day. Day. Exactly. The day. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, you, you can now um, on some of the modern scanners, because I actually supply ultrasound machines as well, if anyone's interested. Uh, but um, uh, <laughs> most of the modern scanners now will do uh, gestational age as oh, well. Fantastic. So, um, so you, you know, you can check dates and things like that. Obviously, not so much after a certain um, so, after, yeah. you know, too, too late. So a good rule of thumb around this time would be obviously we know how much she was eating pre-mating pre-early pregnancy it's normally about one and a half times what they needed then at this stage so that's that's you know just your, your a bit of a rule of thumb. sort of rough rough guide um of what they needed pre-pregnancy um so you can get these gestational diets that are meant to be marketed for bitches that are you know, in pregnancy or in lactation, pregnancy. but yeah. it, essentially it, they, they are very similar to the puppy diets. So, you know, the, and, and actually then if you've got that puppy food, then you, you can, you can um, uh, then uh, switch the puppies onto it. Yes. Yeah, split the meals. Um, you sometimes get that loss of appetite, don't you? Just before yeah. whelping. But yeah. if you've made those preparations beforehand, you don't need to panic because she's already then laid down some extra, you know, um, uh, nutrition in subcutaneous fat at that point, yeah. which is fine. Um, Cause she's going to use it, you know, she's cause gonna she's going to use it. Use she that. absolutely is. Early lactation is, is the most demanding time um, for the bit. She's going to be producing really highly concentrated milk for obviously, you know, sometimes six, eight, 10, 12 puppies. Um, Ideally, it's much easier than if you've already transitioned them onto a diet that's suitable for this time. Mm. Um, because even if you fed any diet ad lib, they still probably wouldn't be able to take in enough energy. No. You know, they are going to lose you yeah. condition at that point. And what you don't want to do is them to lose having to lose so much condition that they're actually having to draw supplies from their muscle, okay. you know, better. Because but, that, that's something that I did want to what, touch on. Um, you know, I think that what we do underestimate is that they go from, 
you know, being relatively active. And although they do slow down across their pregnancy, I've got a spaniel that's pregnant at the moment and she's like, she's a live wire. She's just as lively now. And she's, you know, she's only got a couple of weeks to go less than that. So, you know, it's, it's, she's going to go from being pretty active to laying on her side, feeding these puppies so her muscle is going to be lost as well. So when we talk about losing condition, she's actually going to lose, you know, imagine what we would feel like if we just went and laid down in bed for two weeks and didn't get up. We'd feel as weak as a kitten, wouldn't we? When we tried to get up, we'd lose our muscle tone. And I mm. think for me, I see this in the bitches as well. I see that it isn't just body fat and weight and condition in that regard. It's also their muscle mass just disappears. Mm. Um, and they look you know, where they'd be covered, they'd have a good top and a good neck and a good back, that all tends to sink and drop because the muscle disappears because they're mm. inactive, they're laying, feeding puppies and they lose their muscle tone. And I think that's why puppy food is is it is better to be feeding because it is much higher in protein than your yeah, standard yeah, adult maintenance diets. Yeah, okay. Um, and so you, you, by providing that higher protein, and it's not all about the protein because it is really important that they're getting, you know, the the micronutrients, the selenium, the zinc and the copper and the, you know, calcium and, and all of that as well. Um, but, you know, that loss of condition will be minimised if they're having, you know, a, a good um, quality, you know, and it's not just about the amount of protein, but how easy it is to absorb as well. Excellent. Excellent. And then, so, okay. So we're at the point where we've got puppies. She's feeding, she's feeding the puppy. She's in the whelping book. She's on yeah. puppy food. Yeah. So from this point, okay. Weaning late lactation. And once they're weaned, we should then the amount given should be reduced to about half that, that, that in that late um, stage that they were eating at that ad lib stage basically you're just feeding them when they want to be fed as much as they possibly want in that you know first three weeks um and then as you know the, i mean naturally you know the bitch is going to be moving away from the puppies i mean it depends how strong their mother in instinct to some do and some sometimes don't, you just you, know. you need to sort of do that themselves but yeah. the puppies will become less interested and almost, you know, she'll need she she'll naturally take more breaks. While you know, mo most most um, of them, bitch, yeah. most <laughs> you do have to be careful about that. Um, but then, and as that milk production is reducing, she doesn't need as much of that protein and that energy. Um, and ideally, the weight that she is at that point, obviously, she's lost all that pregnancy fluid and 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 all of that as well. It shouldn't really be any lower than when she was mated because we've obviously got she she gained didn't she up to sort of 25 percent you know when before uh pregnancy so keeping a really close eye on that and also um you can do you can do body condition scoring but you can also do muscle condition scoring as well which is something that you know your vet can help you with and it's all about that sort of not how round they are and around their spine you know, and, and you can often feel, you know, if that goes down, you know, um, that, that they're, they're, lo they're losing that. And then after that, you know, once they're weaned, it's then going on to high quality condition, maintaining that healthy weight um, and then restoring that, that any loss of any lean body mass. So that muscle building that, that up, muscle again. Build back up again, but building up the muscle, not necessarily building up, you know, the fat layers. So it's, it is a really tricky balance because it all happens so quickly, you know, in the space of yeah, it does. And know, eight different. weeks they're of pregnancy. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Think and you've then got it, you think you've got it sussed with one bitch and then yeah. another bitch will just be completely different. You know, and again, and anyone then, who knows me knows we've got a dog here called Tweedy, who is just the fattest spaniel. She looks pregnant all of the time. I mean, she has like four pieces of kibble in the morning and four pieces of kibble at night. She's just like me. Yeah. She just holds her weight. Yeah. And, that's it. And, and then, you know, we had another bitch here a while back called Lola, who just looked awful, awful. She looked like an RSPCA case. And I'd be shoveling food into her and I'd be like, oh, my yeah. goodness, this dog looks horrendous. She just looks terrible. She just used to lose weight every single time. She yeah, her, and, I, you know? and I think it's it, it often then you, at the sort of at the end of their breeding cycles, 
you're then thinking, right, well, we're going to get them spayed to prevent pyometra yeah. and all the rest of it. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, it's actually the the females that are more prone to that. People are, oh, well, they, they got neutered and they, they put on all the weight. But, you know, they only put on the weight because you provided more they were still eating what they were eating before because the metabolic rate, well, we know it's not necessarily metabolic rate now, but their, their food seeking behavior, their behavior changes towards food and they'll often become more food orientated than they were before. And that can mean they, 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 not, they might eat the same as they did, but then that might lead to lead to weight gain. So again, you have to be really careful about, you know, that, you know, at the end of their sort of breeding life. Um, that obviously you know they're maintained into their older age fantastic that has been really 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 useful I'm going to just scroll through is it if anybody's got any questions start typing because there's always a bit of a lag so um okay so Patricia Owen is asking um is Bayer testing best performed on puppies or can this be conducted at any age so the hearing tests ah uh, yes um it, I think it's best to do um, when when they're puppies um, and it's not something that, you know, it, it's only done at, at certain um, places around the country. So, you know, I think the difficulty is getting in, you know, early enough. OK, thank you. Uh, Victoria Robinson says, it says, is there any chance you can share the chart, that weight chart that you were talking about um, for... Uh, or bitches amount. and what they need yeah in pregnancy yeah i can i can get um uh, a copy um of that um in if nothing else it just shows you how their needs completely change right. you know particularly you know with with large litters you know that it is almost you know impossible you know particularly if you're feeding an adult maintenance food say Okay. that you yeah, would be able to there. reach the, the... Would be, I think that would be really useful because we do see questions there are you know I was going to say arguments but contentious posts around do you feed puppy food or don't you feed puppy food to pregnant bitches if we could have that chart that would be really useful yeah and, and, and it's not necessarily that they need it in pregnancy but it's that actually are you then going to change their food after they've had the lit you know and yeah yeah you know yeah, it's yeah. no good changing it two weeks into the that lactation because it's almost too late by then you know yeah i've got june saying um it would be a good idea for vets to educate dogs and owners and people asking about finding a puppy to encourage breeders that are licensed they know breeders health test the females and the risks of going to the cheapest puppies a vet will can reassure her that there are yeah. so yeah. many you, think, you know that. we've got Lucy's law now um we've got the um we've got um you know the bva are constantly you know lobbying government to you know have this more as a priority you know to prevent you know importing of of puppies and you know obviously you know not just illegal imports yeah. but yeah. you know because the standards that we want to hold the UK breeders to it's not then fair if people are, are just you know sort of going through the back door and and right. getting puppies from from no. abroad that you'd think you know are one of animal welfare standards in the UK are world leading um but you know it's a case of continuing to to educate owners and Absolutely. potential owners about that so that they make the right decisions. Absolutely. You know, we, we're all, you know, Singing wanting to do this, yeah, to, to, um, to, to, to maximise that. Grace Wells is saying, um, have you got anything to share on IVDD testing? That's for Daxies, isn't it? I think. Um, I don't think there's any official uh, breed screening that the BVA run that I'm aware of. But IVDD been, for the long, in, um, for the long spine yeah, dogs. Yeah, intervertebral disc disease. Yeah. It's, but I don't think there's any, um, you know, it, um, scheme and and all. I know what really does help people think. Oh well, I don't want, you know, it, it sort of restrict the exercise. But actually, you know ensuring you know um a good level of exercise is really important but super um victoria robinson saying is there a potential opportunity to set up breeding clinics with nurses discussing health te tests and potential issues etc 
um actually having those yeah a few different breeders coming together and then yeah and, yeah. and veterinary yeah just you know or, or you know or, or even having a maybe like a monthly or a six weekly thing at a clinic where breeders could come in and discuss get some advice yeah I mean I think if you know you know breeders within an area you know go to ask your vets you know they there's the, yeah. they'll be you know they'll be really keen to provide you know the 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 services that you need but you need to you know ha get that conversation going yeah definitely and that goes back to our first point doesn't it about yeah. creating that relationship but, you know potentially you know that's they they don't want to be doing those re you know really um, you know, urgent operations or, or, or problems, you know, far better having healthy dogs in for, uh, you know, um, hip scores than having to, you know, examine a dog of two years old, two years of age and inform the owner that unfortunately, you know, the, the dog that they've got has, has unfortunately yeah. got, you know, has got hip dysplasia. So, you know, the, the far, you know, it, it's a bit like, you know, um, it's and it's also, you know, um, that's even though you think, oh, they're just out, you know, to to, you know, uh, make a quick buck themselves vets in terms of, you know, um, oh, that, you know, they like thing, being sick. No, much better that they have this regular income in terms of preventative health much much better and not i'm not just talking about the health schemes and the vaccinations and parasite control the the real preventative stuff that in terms of you know saves lives and and reduces the risk of disease really long term you know they they would really you know if there was a a, a group of you know um uh breeders that you know that they'd be delighted to be able to provide these services and it's the same thing you know saying oh vets are only in it for the money is no different from saying breeders are only in it for the money right at the end of yeah. the day we've all got bills to pay breeders have got bills to pay and so have vets but yeah. we're all in it because we love animals that's that's yeah. got to be our go-to place yeah. so let's just move away from the negative <laughs> stuff and let's come from a place of we've all got know, to make a living haven't we but you know exactly for the good of the dogs and yes yeah. we've got to make a living and that's fine my mortgage has got to be paid at the end of the month the same as everybody else but you know that doesn't mean that people are doing things in an immoral fashion you know, at all mm. you know we need to and i think also these. you know there's that whole actually you know you have got to put your hand in your pocket as a breeder because there isn't insurance available no, you know you've no. got to take that risk yourself yeah, yeah you and do. so and it's a choice you know, it's a choice it's not yeah. a compulsory thing mm. it's a choice you've chosen to walk a path and along yeah. that path comes so it's your course. responsibility that's just, to, the road, to, that's just the way exactly it goes. Uh, one really good question and we'll, we'll we will call it a night after that because we've kept you for long enough um would you still um test hips and elbows for example um from of a, on a puppy if you know that the parents are zero zero um well, number one, I wouldn't test a puppy. You have to wait till they're a year off. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I would still get that dog tested. Excellent. Yeah, because genetics is obviously a huge um, uh, part of, you know, the elbow disease and, and hip disease. But it's not just about the genetics. There are, you know, huge different numbers of different genes involved, but it's also about, you know, the environment that that. They, they live in the sort of exercise they get the nutrition there's so many factors that you know the and okay it's just a snapshot but you know potentially it you know a stud dog it, it how many litters is it is it going to have yeah, potentially yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. um yeah. and and even even for a bitch you know that's still a significant number um, and so no, I, I, even with, yeah, zero, even zero, with, I would still. Dogs that are zero, zero. Excellent. That's really, really useful. Thank you so much. 
Um, there's no more questions. You've answered them all. You've been oh, amazing. Brilliant. Oh, I've had, I feel like I've uh, had an easy ride there with the questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, we're all very nice over here, actually. We've got that bad, <laughs> honestly. Um, but thank you so much for, for coming um, and sharing your, your knowledge with us. We've had a really, really informative and wonderful evening um, and a really lovely way to round off on, on National Dog Breeder Day. So thank you so much. If anybody um, wants to speak to Caroline about any of the services that she offers, she is a locum vet. She does um, practice in the Manchester area, um, although I'm sure if you were to contact her on her Facebook page, she would give you a telephone appointment if she's got some time. <laughs> I'm sure she would be able to do that for you. Um, and um, I know that there are a few people in the group who would be qualified to um, ultrasound. As she says, she does sell ultrasound equipment. So she's somebody that you could you could speak to about that if you wanted to. You can catch her on Facebook. Um, it's Dr. Caroline um on 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 facebook Dr. caroline the slim pet vet you'll the find me there you can send me a message there and the new um, website, if you've got any any the other new website is coming in january which is www.theslimvet at uh, the slim pet vet i can't get my head around that i keep saying <laughs> the wrong thing so, .co .uk. so yes but that's what we're looking for um you know if you if you need her that's what you're looking for um and i'm sure she will be happy to answer any questions that you have so Brilliant. And you've given me an idea about these uh, breeding clinics and monthly clinics. Maybe it's something that, um, you know, we could uh, put our hands together on, Rebecca. Yeah, definitely. I definitely think so. Because, you know, we like I say, back to the very, the very, very first point, I have a lot of breeders in the groups who who are not getting an, a, 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 a positive reception when they go to the vets they're not and and I know I make no judgment about that because I I do have first-hand experience of dealing with the rescue side of things so I understand why there can be some hostilities there however that doesn't make it you know easy if people are trying to get succinct information on dog breeding it, it creates a, a void and it means that people don't feel so open and approachable so yeah definitely we can we can it's really can, difficult isn't it the environment yeah. because yes you know we know that there are you know lots of dogs that are surplus to requirements let's say or they've had a bad start or you know they haven't been suitable in their first home and, and they're in kennels but we also have a lot of people perhaps saying oh I've rescued my dog oh where did you get it well I paid this much and imported it from yeah. xyz yeah um and it's you you sort of think well where have those dogs are they they're, where have they come from you bought where it. have they come from you know there's there's a lot of stray animals out yeah. there who are yeah. being imported from all these different places yeah, yeah. and you think well actually is this you know a little bit under the radar people sort of feel like they're doing the right thing rescuing a dog but you no, know it's it's yeah. it's but you see all of this you know you you guys are at the front line of that kind of side of things you see you see the good, the bad and the ugly. You know, that's that's the long and the short of it. We and see and, and unfortunately, really... you know, I'm seeing more dogs uh, with um, uh, not just dog tails, but cropped ears. Oh, um, you know, Definitely and it's obviously, on, yeah. you know, it's it's illegal in the UK for a reason, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, the fashions, you know, whether it's from the US or, or Europe, you know, it, it unfortunately. And then you ask. Oh, why? Why did you get a dog with with quite? Oh, well, that's it did, sort of didn't have a choice. It's like well, you that's did have a came. choice. Yeah, you could have, have said no. I'm not going to have that puppy. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. You exactly. know, it's, it's so all a choice. It's yeah. It's it's it um it's it's educating the general public in terms of you know continuing with you know the the best that we can for animal yeah. welfare basically. Well, maybe maybe we could look at offering um I don't know a bi monthly drop in Zoom clinic for people. Yeah. You know, where, where yeah. breeders can come in and we can. What about that, guys? If you think that would be a good idea, yeah. thumbs up. Yeah. Um, you know, know, maybe we could maybe we could arrange something where, you know, every other month we had a couple of hours on a Zoom call where oh, there's lots of thumbs up happening. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, lots of thumbs up happening, lots of little blue thumbs <laughs> flying across my screen. Um, you know, maybe that's something that we could we could look at providing for for everybody um, so that they've got a, a port of call to come and get some advice if they yeah. need it, you know, so yeah. that yeah. would be good. Fantastic. I am going to yeah, let, well, let you go. I'm going to let you go. But thank you so much. It's been amazing. 
guys thanks so much happy, for having me happy 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 national dog breeder day well it's done it's, it's you. you've, you've done really well well done so, it's it's, it's been, been an amazing week well done see you later guys bye